name is Samir Bhakri, and on behalf of Give India, it is my pleasure to extend a very warm welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for taking time out and for joining us this evening. 2014 has been an action-packed year for Give India's first Futures Club and one of great accomplishments. Our mission to build a robust culture of giving has received tremendous support from all our stakeholders, internal as well as external. And I'd like to highlight a few key initiatives that have come through. One, members of the club have channeled over 30 crores of funds towards various causes of their choice. And over 50 crores since inception in 2010. More interestingly, about 40 members are now engaged with causes that they deeply care about, and a few are also on the advisory boards of the respective organizations they support, providing assistance where needed. One member has even taken the bold step of setting up a nonprofit entity working towards improving health care among children. We had the privilege a few months ago of hearing Mr. Bill Gates at our annual summit in Mumbai. A truly inspirational talk. Mr. Gates spoke about the potential legacy of his philanthropy work, saying, if we are successful in getting rid of a disease like polio, then people in the future won't be able to understand what that disease is. Encouraged by a first Givers Club member, we ventured out to Singapore and there met with over 75 individuals and families interested in giving back to their group. Last but not, not least, Give India was a knowledge partner for the third time with Forbes Philanthropy Awards to applaud and recognize the efforts of individuals who have given their time, money, skill, and expertise to create model institutions and inspired several others. And it is to learn and gain from the personal giving journeys of a few of these individuals that we are here this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor and a privilege to have with us here Mrs. Rodney and Mr. Nanda Nikan. A Padma Bhushan awardee, a philanthropist, a businessman, an author, a global thinker, and according to the Times magazine, one of the hundred most influential people in the world. Mr. Nanda Nilikani was most recently the chairman of the Unique Identification Authority of India. Mrs. Rodney Nilikani is founder chairperson Arkia, an initiative that aims to provide safe and sustainable water for all. She's also had a major part to play in the development of the education sector for lesser fortunate children through her associations with Pratham Books and Akshara Foundation. As a committed philanthropist, she continues to fund work in areas such as governance and accountability, independent media, education and research, and environmental sustainability. Romi has also been mentioned among Forbes Asia's 48 heroes of philanthropy for three consecutive years, 2008, 2009, and 2000. Not surprisingly, Forbes awarded the Millikanese Outstanding Philanthropist of the Year 2013. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in extending a very warm welcome. <laughs> Joining them in conversation is Mr. Mahesh Krishnamurti, currently a partner IBFA and a member of the advisory panel for high net worth individuals at Give India. His career includes stints at KT Venture Group, a corporate venture capital fund sponsored by KLA Tencorp, McKinsey, AT&T, and Honeywell. Mahesh has been leading India Venture Fund's giving initiatives. May I now request Mahesh to please accompany Mrs. Rohini and Mr. Nandan Nilikani to the stage. Housekeeping rules, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't already, then please switch your phones to the silent mode. 
There will be a question in our session, and we'll try and make it as long as possible. So please hold on to your questions, jot them down, and we'll provide you as many opportunities as possible to pose these questions. Over to you, Mahesh. I did Bombay and 
I think in, in the first part of my financial tweet was like repaying my old debts kind of thing. So I went back to all the schools and colleges that I had ever been to and systematically gave them some endowments. So it was uh, more of that. And then uh, later on, uh, I thought, I, because I was busy first with Infosys and then with this other thing, I didn't really have, I didn't want to do anything full time for set up an organization. So I focused on funding different organizations and uh, also uh, mainly in, uh, say for example, one of the places that we have funded is this thing called Indian Institute of Human Settlements because we think that urbanization is a huge uh, challenge for India. So the idea is to set up India's first university that focuses only on sustainable urbanization. So that's coming up now in Bangalore. And then uh, we also felt that you know think tanks are required if India is to progress and we in high quality think tanks like in the US, so we funded NCAER. So it's really been those kind of uh, large ticket kind of things which we have done. Uh, but right now for the first time, I'm actually combining philanthropy with my full-time action. And uh, we have set up a foundation to look at literacy issues, uh, which is an idea that Roni gave that maybe we should do something about literacy using technology. So that's one where I, where it's both a philanthropic initiative as well as an executive role in actually making it happen. So I guess you can say it began from giving repaying debts to all my alma maters through checkbook philanthropy to actually engaging on the ground in an, in an executive match fashion. I really look forward to learning more uh, about some of your future plans. See, one of the things that strikes me is you know, both of you seem very thoughtful in the causes that you give. At the same time, also very eclectic. Okay, you've given money, you've given time, they UIT, AI, you've shared your networks, you've given to popular areas, IIT Bombay and Yale, it doesn't get any more popular than that. At the same time, you've also been far-sighted in picking on water and sanitation, or for that matter, in tanks, which India desperately needs, or urbanization. Supported NGOs, small and large, and created your own. So, what is what is the thought process? I mean, how do you how do you think about what to uh, give for? I think uh, you know always often philanthropists start because some some issue really gets at them that they feel passionate about that they want to have a role in solving. And we've seen around the world also many people start by setting up their own foundations and learning the ropes of giving in one focus area that they feel passionate about. So just like I set up Algyam, uh, even though uh, Akshara was a, a public-private partnership set up by the government of Karnataka in co collaboration with Prasam Network actually. But so many people start off by setting up a foundation which does a specific kind of activity that they care much about and want to learn the ropes of giving and giving effectively. So um, that's how most people do it. But one of the things that has uh, both Nathan and I uh, feel strongly about is very clearly none of us have all the answers. And uh, if you give too much of your philanthropy within your own gate, you're perhaps losing out on the opportunity to give forward to other people who have experience, who have passion, <coughs> who have commitment, and who need resources such as money. They may need other resources as well. So therefore, we have really diversified our philanthropy way beyond our own walls and gates. And we give very widely outside too, in very diverse areas. Because in India, we need to do everything. You can't do it all. But wherever possible, at least I, when I find um, committed leadership that has been working in certain areas, like you mentioned, that I care about, um, I do like to find that as well. Um, also, institution building is something we both care about. Think tanks being one example. Yeah, now for example, if you look at the urbanization thing, uh, it began because I spent five years on Bangalore City, and we had something called the Bangalore Task Force, on which actually we spent a fair amount of money in bringing in intellectual expertise for making the city better. And then uh, I funded something called eGovernment Foundation, which has developed software for about 400 cities, which uses software to manage it. So I, I had an enduring interest in urbanization. But then I realized that you know, if you take the next 30 years, if a few hundred million people are going to move into cities, unless we have the sort of capability to deal with that, we can't really address it. So, so then the logical thing was to have a university which produced quality 
uh, you know, people with interdisciplinary skills on uh, urban urban issues. So that's what led to the urban project. Think tanks again. I think you know, if you look at the history of the U.S. 20th century or all, the great think tanks were built, whether it's Brookings or Carnegie and all that. So looking at that and realizing that in India we really need that kind of uh, intellectual horsepower for the next few years. So that led to the thing on think tanks. The current initiative that we have again came from the realization that you know uh, we are seeing that uh, India has spent a huge amount of money on education in the last 15 years right from the Sarva Shiksha we are onwards and uh, while there has been a great progress in getting kids into school the thing is the learning outcomes are not up to date. In fact tomorrow we are going to Delhi for the launch of the 10th ASA report, 10th anniversary and the report shows that there is no particular improvement in uh, learning outcomes. And then we thought maybe is there a way to use modern technology, smartphones, game based learning to change that. That's what has led us to our current thing where we also, I'm actually running it, I'm not just spending the money but also doing it. So that's where, so it sort of come to these conclusions from different journeys. Whichever silo you work in, be it education, microfinance, sanitation, food or health, you will eventually hit the governance deficit. The reason we don't have equity and stability is because somewhere our governance failures catch up with us. So be it urbanization, be it uh, the example Nandan that you just gave about, in spite of a lot of investments in education, not getting the outcome. Sometimes I want to be the first list taker, but you can pool resources and do it. Or like 
have people like John Soros, whom I admire for many reasons. You have to do it clandestinely. And he supported democracy behind the Iron Curtain in many innovative ways by funding a lot of groups. So I think it's important in India to be funding issues of governance. Uh, you can do it quite safely, or you can take tremendous risks. Uh, but it's very necessary because no matter which sector you work in, it won't work unless you fix the pipelines. And if we don't fix the plumbing, so I'll hand it over to Nandan, who's done a good job of fixing the biggest plumbing pipe of all. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you know, I, I've had a sort of unique, uh, sort of, I've seen it from all angles, right? I've run a company for 30 years. I've done the world's large, one of the world's largest projects inside the government. I've run, run for election. I've supported NGOs. So I've seen the whole thing. And I, I think, the real particular will only come from governance kind of things, right? Because we can always do some something uh, at a certain level, but if you want to scale it up, then you need to think of it differently. Not that everybody has to do scale, it's just that I like to do scale, so that's my problem. So so I think once you look at things at scale, then you realize that it becomes a whole different approach to fixing things. And then it comes back to the governance. The other, other thing is that very often what happens is that when, when governments and the state identifies a, 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 a problem area, it then it highlights that area and then it starts putting resources into that area. But how effective that is, is often overlooked. And therefore, I think one key role that outside philanthropists can do is actually provide the soft capital in some sense to make the spending more effective or whatever. So there's a lot of that kind of intervention that can be done, which can be done by philanthropists. In fact, I want to probe that a little bit because if you look at a giving one-on-one textbook, one of the things they tell you, which I believe is completely wrong, but they tell you is look at what are the overhead expenses and give to organizations that don't have overhead, okay, and, or have the least amount of overhead. And to me, those are organizations that just don't have the resources to grow, the resources to evaluate what is it that they're doing well and what is it that they're doing poorly, right? And one of the things I was fascinated by some of your early giving, uh, and also, I mean, I think some of the people, even within the first giving club, is people who are making unrestricted grants, right? Because, see, governance is not just with respect to the government. Even many NGOs don't have a succession plan. They're all single person shops. They don't have a team. Okay, they don't evaluate uh, what they do. Uh, so I'm hoping you'll make a you know, plug for uh, <coughs> giving for institution building. No, absolutely. We totally believe in that, whether it's at Algium or um, anywhere else. Because uh, one of the reasons NGOs are not able to be as effective as they could be is precisely because they're perpetually chasing around for things that they need to be functioning better. And many uh, givers haven't really um, understood that perhaps. Surprisingly, even people who's, who understand that perfectly well when they're building their own enterprises, but when they look at the NGO sector, somehow don't reflect that so well. So I would urge everybody very much. You need accountants, you need HR people, you need admin people, you need finance people, you need leadership. HR function is really critically important in NGOs and severely under understood and underfunded. So all those functions means people, means resources, and then of course you're going to get much better bang for the philanthropic bucket you do that. So I couldn't agree with you more. We need to help build leadership. We need so many things, all of which takes a philanthropist who understands that just like you do in businesses, and you can't possibly um, be successful without giving good um, attention to those department functions, you need the same thing on this side. That's why we have so many one people, two people, three people NGOs who are not able to scale. In fact, let me generalize from there, right? I mean, when you look at the world of NGOs, philanthropy, and the government in India, the whole interaction, one can easily build a story of the glass is half full. Equally well, you can fill a story that it's half empty. So on one hand, we have a million NGOs, but we have to sort of ask the question how many of them are scaled relative to the size of the problem that they're pursuing. <coughs> on one hand, India has a long philanthropic, philanthropic tradition. On the other hand, giving is still relatively small, and it's to walk very traditional causes. It's not necessarily to issues that are core to where India needs to be 
over the next 30 years. And there are, I mean, one can rattle off any number of causes <coughs> where the total giving would be sub 10 crores when it will be 100x that. Similarly, you can give many examples where the government sees NGOs as a partner after the great one. Or, oh no, actually, it is not. No, 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 the government doesn't like to be uh, necessarily told that the schools are not functioning well. Oh, fair enough. <laughs> or maybe they see them as an adversary in so many cases. Okay? And both of you, I mean, you've spent a long time in philanthropy. Nandan, you've spent a long time in government. Okay? What are your broad thoughts on the state of the philanthropy world in India? Okay? And the role, and you've written a book called Imagining India. So the role that NGOs can play in building an India of all our dreams. Well, I think certainly, uh, I think in the last uh, four to five years, there's been a remarkable upsurge in uh, giving and philanthropy. And, you know, we can see that in front of our eyes. Uh, we are involved with various initiatives to encourage and broad-based philanthropy, and there's tremendous, uh, you know, uptake on that. So I think that's happening, and I think it's also related to the fact that we have, uh, you know, first-generation wealth happening. You know, uh, uh, you know, both professionals and entrepreneurs. Uh, are there and so I, I think there's definitely a change happening. I think uh, there's, a, there's an issue of absorption capacity also, and the system can't. In fact, there are many big givers now having challenges finding enough good organizations to fund because they don't on the other side don't have the infrastructure to absorb the money or don't have the governance and, and so on. Uh, so I think to me the uh, philanthropy is a form of risk capital because uh, you know. It, Philanthropists have to do things that uh, governments can't do and markets won't do. Governments can do something so I can allocate billions of dollars to a problem, but making it effective, making it transformational is, is often a challenge. Markets and market players have to ultimately make profits, so they can't really do some long-term things. So the philanthropists can, and NGOs can, but often they don't have the scale to do it. So the philanthropists can sort of be somewhere in the intersection of all that and look for things to do which uh, which you know the other players can't do because it's risk capital it's capital that you know you're willing to give away so i think that's the way i think about that so i look for things which are where nobody else is going to go in and, and make a difference yeah but the real irony in that is while you know while philanthropy should be about risk capital the danger is that philanthropists are not willing to take those risks they want to measure everything and want to make sure everything has impact I would say philanthropists should say nine things failed, oh that's wonderful. That means we tried ten things and one succeeded. But in, in India today, while people are giving more, and you can see that right here, you know, I wish they would give more without fear of without that fear that we have to be successful and showing back. In your companies, okay, you have to show your shareholders, your bottom line has to look fantastic. Here we are accountable to society, of course. Every rupee of philanthropy is a rupee that might have otherwise gone to government as taxation. So it is highly accountable to society. But I think let's take more risks. It's okay to fail when you are doing philanthropy. It's okay to allow people who are committed to something and want to try something new to do it. Um, of course, ethically and with integrity, but risk capital. So risk is the key word. Let me, let me challenge you for a little bit. Wonderful. That is philanthropy uh, as venture capital. Okay. Since I come from the private equity industry, what would it take to see philanthropy as private equity? And, and let me explain what I mean by that. If you take literally any cause, and I can probably rattle off dozens, and collectively we can rattle off hundreds, okay? We should be seeing organizations that are scaled up, that have the ability to raise hundreds, if not thousands of crores each year. Okay, and spend that effectively, right? Now, what would it take to get to that world? Because if somebody asked me for scale organizations in India, I would sort of mention Akshay Patra. It's scaled relative to a venture capital model, but is it scaled relative to the need? Don't know. You can take something like Pratham and say that perhaps it's scaled even relative to need because more than intellectual, this thing. But very quickly, my list stops, right? So what would it take? Uh, and, and actually, I think a lot of the problem on 
also lies within the NGOs because most of the NGOs we've interacted thanks to Give India uh, don't have a team, uh, don't think of fundraising as a core aspect of what we need to do. It's it, I can go on and on. So, uh, I mean, today, clearly, I think we are in the philanthropy as venture capital uh, model. But what would it take to get the philanthropy as a private equity uh, opportunity? Well, it, it seems both sides. I mean, you, 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 if you remember, uh, when we did the whole IIT Bombay thing, it was just it was a new concept and it took time to even get everyone on board about raising money and then finding projects for this money and so on. Whereas if you go to a private US university, they have a complete machinery for raising enormous amounts of money for all kinds of causes. So they do that in a very systematic way. So I think here it's both, right? I mean, you need demand in the sense you need organizations that need money and you need supply of philanthropist capital. You need both happening. So one can't be done without the other. You can't create a great organization unless there's an <coughs> expected flow of money to come in. So I think when, when both these things start falling into place, then you're going to have uh, have what you said. The other thing is also about the talent in the NGO sector. I think uh, a lot of people come to the NGO sector out of passion, and uh, uh, often the passion and ideology drives what they do. And uh, But now we are seeing more and more people moving with corporate experience, managerial experience, scaling and scaling up experience moving into this, this field. So as that happens, the, the, the people in this field who can think, scale, the people who think, who can execute, the people who can build large organizations and have the practice, that's also going to go up. So once that happens, then the, the, scale, the scale, and already you're seeing some of that, you know, as, as, as uh, philanthropists are giving larger and larger grants, you're seeing some, some of the organizations now say, okay, now we can scale up our operations. So it, Requires both these things to happen in tandem. It can't be one without the other. There's also, sorry, uh, uh, you know, uh, this is something I pointed out before. There is an ideological mismatch between the givers and those who need much resources. There's a political mismatch. So many of our NGOs, for very good reasons, uh, have been on the left side of the political spectrum, have been on the Gandhian side of the political spectrum. Uh, when the people like Mehta Parker are standing with thousands of people, literally knee deep in the Narbana River, saying that where are we supposed to go? Our rehabilitation money promised by the government, promised by law, has not come to us. I can't think of too many philanthropists in India today who are going to stand up and say, yes, this is the just cause and we need to support it. I, I just mentioned that, not necessarily that particular cause, but causes like that, which are to do with exclusion, which are to do with rights, which have to do with political rights, which have to do with humanitarian issues that maybe may, some of us don't like to think about or talk too much about. Which we hope that our government is actually following certain principles of justice, but there are too many people <coughs> left out. Those kinds of people to scale would need a lot more resources to come to them and a lot of ideological um, uh, matchmaking to happen before. So I think there has been an ideological divide. I don't think today's and. Um, Today's uh, people who made wealth from markets, from liberalization, and have the freedom to give that away, I'm not so sure they would give it to Gandhian or Marx, Marxist-oriented or left or socialist-oriented organizations. And actually, most of our NGOs used to be in those political spaces. Today, you're seeing a different kind of um, NGO come up, more dealing with service delivery or uh, transparency or very new sort of issues that the rest of the world uh, NGOs are also engaged in. So now you're beginning to see a very different player, both on the philanthropy side and the NGO side. So you might get a different kind of scale. Uh, Romy, would you speculate why that is? Because that is something I've wondered a long time. Because if you look at our freedom movement, okay, it, it followed the Gandhian principles. And yet, when you come back to the Nathura Bachao Antolan, and let's leave aside the issue on whether the dam should have been built, not built, large dam, small dam. Let's leave that aside. Let's just focus on the issue of a commitment made by the government for rehabilitation that was not kept. Okay? So what is stopping society from giving more support? Uh, I, no, I really think it's political philosophies that don't match. I really no, think is, that it, is it political philosophies or let me get to my favorite soapbox, which I can say in a closed room, is that we don't live in a free country. Okay? There are a lot of people who believe something, but they're scared to sort of tailor their giving to their own belief system. Okay? Okay? Uh, so, so you mean they actually believe that no, 
they, they may believe in their heart that, look, I need to, you know, in, in the case of Neha Bhatkar, make sure that the government meets its own commitment on rehabilitation. Okay? Uh, or, for, for example, I mean, I, I know the Narega thing has caused a lot of debate. Okay? But what I'm fascinated is in our circles, it is very rare. Okay, to see somebody who takes the view that, look, if we're going to be a prosperous country, at a bare minimum level, the government should pro provide some protection. Right? So I'm at, or for that matter, we need to import another of my favorite two boxes. If you read any of the Indian newspapers okay, and spend a year reading them, it would be very difficult to persuade yourself that we live in a relatively poor country where there are real challenges, mm -hmm. right? So what is, uh, and, and, and the reason I'm asking you this question is you funded two organizations which in some ways are at the opposite end of the spectrum, economic and political big being mm -hmm. in India, mm -hmm. okay? And it takes a pretty unusual way of looking at the world to say that, look, for the same person to fund things that are so far away. So two questions, right? One. Why is our philanthropy so narrow? Okay, and the second question is what is your thought process in funding things sure. that uh, are in some ways opposites of each other? So we'll get Nandan's input on the other thing, but my point on the uh, political philosophies is perhaps people, yes, people believe in justice and equity, but may not like a certain approach or a certain activism and feel comfortable funding it. So Nandan will give his view just after I tell you why I fund people on both sides of the ideological spectrum. I think both are one, EPW is a, a left-leaning, uh, very important weekly that uh, addresses issues that perhaps many others in the media just don't. And Takshashila uh, is a right-leaning think tank that also produces uh, publications. Um, both of them, I think, come with high integrity, with commitment. I think in India today, we need to deepen the political discourse we need to deepen a, a civil political discourse. Um, and I think that's the reason I can say that I don't have to agree with everybody I fund. It would be impossible. I'd be only funding two or three people if I did. <coughs> because nobody could possibly agree with everyone so much. But there are certain basic things about a good society, a, a democracy. What are the pillars of a good democracy? Good public platforms to discuss and help convince each other. So that's the reason why I'm able to fund both Dr. and EPW and know why I'm doing so. Um, I'd like to hear Nandan and the um, philosophical and political mismatches with activism and funding. I know. Is your question or question? Jonathan is starting to take over. <laughs> no, I, I think, uh, I mean, having been in the system and worked for five years, I think uh, a lot of uh, people don't really think about the complexity of what, what's going on out there. And uh, I am acting in my, in my own journey. I mean, before I got into urban issues, I had no idea how cities functioned. Only after I spent five years in the trenches of city management, I realized how, what are the issues there. And similarly, if you take Narega and all that, I mean, people say, that, okay, why are you giving these wages? But 150 million people in this country get an LPG subsidy, which used to be about 500 rupees per cylinder, 10 cylinders a year, 5,000 rupees for no work. And if somebody is being paid, you know, 100 rupees a day for 50 days, that's the equivalent of getting free LPG subsidies. So I think we don't fully understand the inequalities that we have. So I think uh, uh, that awareness building is, is very much required because I think uh, this whole thing won't work with a narrow set of people moving forward. And uh, so I think, uh, and that requires radical change in the way we deliver education, opportunity, healthcare, mobility. Everything has to change. And that's really what the challenge is. I think in some sense, you know, um, a few generations got depoliticized. And somewhere in the education system, perhaps that happened. It's a bit of a generalization. But uh, in the sense, po politics is about the redistribution of power in society. And I think what what we read, what, what this discourse happens in public shapes our sense of society. And I think somewhere for a couple of generations perhaps uh, that became less important than something else. 
I think today we're seeing a repoliticization, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse, but that's how politicization is messy. It's not a smooth linear journey toward public good. So I think it's interesting today that now some really nitty <coughs> subjects are coming back to the discourse. And um, that's what politics is. It's about the redistribution of power. So they're going to have some fun. I, I hope, I mean, the great thing of diversity Managing scale uh, and uh, thinking of scale and thinking of problems at scale and solutions at scale is really what we need to extract from the success of the corporate world. Uh, and uh, that thinking at scale is not an attribute of many NGOs, uh, except a few exceptions like you mentioned. So I think that's the big lesson. And I think today the way we think of scale actually is very different because I think what the Internet has done is, is is essentially reduced coordination and search and you know contracting costs and therefore you don't really necessarily have to build an organization of hundred thousand people. You can create a network of hundred thousand people, but use technology to, to create uh, you know the scale on that. So I think uh, we, you, we will see uh, organizations which will have scale. Uh, uh, hopefully, the one we are building now will have that because our goal is to reach a lot of kids. The actual team will be very small, but the leverage will come from the ecosystem that we create. So I think as more and more people move from running companies to doing things at scale in the non-profit sector, I think you'll see more of that. Uh, I want to shift the conversation a little bit. You look at the first givers talk, the all the families that present here. These are families who have committed to give a significant part of their income, as well as family, to NGOs of their children. So when I was working in Infosys, 
I gave some time and a fair amount of money. When I joined the government, I, I did invest my money in what I was doing, but I gave my time. And that was really important because I think uh, we were able to, in five years, change the whole nature of identity and cash transfers. And you know, it, it's actually going to have a huge impact on subsidy reforms, efficiencies, the whole whole host of things. So that was a very high leverage activity for me, the five years that I spent doing that. Now I'm actually combining my time and my money, which, which is the first time I'm actually doing that. So I'll use the philanthropic capital I have, solve a social problem, and also do it myself using the experience I have of doing things at scale. So I think that's the, uh, now it's actually both coming together to really make a difference. We have to, we'll be fighting a lot if we work together all the time. So you answered my question. How much do you put that? How do you, I mean, do you need to agree? No, we can't agree really on everything. Uh, uh, we have robust disagreements. Um, and uh, that's why I do some philanthropy which you would never do. He does some philanthropy which I may not do. And then now we have some multiple common goals and means that we are working together as well. Well, also I think, you know, ideologically we are different. I mean, I'm more a markets guy. Right? He has more faith in markets, let's say. I ran a company, I created wealth from markets, so I believe in free economy and all that. She's more, uh, you know, socialist. I believe that we need to build a very strong society, a samaj, and we can discuss what that means. We need people's institutions, we need citizens to be empowered to act so that we can keep the markets and the government accountable. Because if we don't have that, Governments can become very oppressive and markets can become very oppressive and the whole of last century is littered with fine examples of both kinds of oppression. So a lot of my philanthropy is about how do we create a citizenry that is aware of its own role, its own responsibility and what markets and state can and uh, can do, should do and should not do. Would you describe some smaller, less known organizations that you're working with that might be suitable I can get so many, but uh, I don't want to select. Be selected there are hundreds. So but a lot of Yeah, yeah. Yes. So, for example, you know, um, I'm going to talk about uh, our Nika Foundation. Our it came out uh, of this work came out of something that we were doing at Algiam. We created um, uh, an Ashwas household uh, survey of sanitation in Karnataka. It was a quite a comprehensive report. And we found out that so many things were wrong, so we went back to GPs with that information. We gave the Gram Panchas their own little report saying, in your GP, here's what we found from you. And here we reflected it back to them and said, we'd like to help you with an action plan uh, to help make things better. And when my team, our teams went around, we found that the GPs didn't feel they had the capacity to say, here's where we want to be in five years and uh, how we systematically make steps towards getting there. And that's when one of my colleagues who has a background in um, organizational behavior said, let's work on this. And over the last five years, she came up with a very detailed process mapping and then a solutions platform for Gram Panchayats to feel as though, to understand that they can be autonomous institutions empowered to make all the line departments where most of the money flows accountable to them horizontally. Right now what happens is government flows money into the Gram Panchayats, but they are accountable upwards into their own programs. Nobody is really accountable to the GP. So this organization has come up with a wonderful uh, solution that is working quite well. Small organization, nobody knows about it yet, but has been selected by the government as a model for the Rajiv Gandhi um, Gra Panchayat Sashakti Karan Abhiyan, and we can talk about it. You might go look it up. Avanti Karpat Varji. Avanti, you have. No, I, I prefer to do fewer big ticket and focus on that. Fair. My last question before we open it up What have been some of the most satisfying moments in philanthropy, and what is your biggest learning experience? You can take it, uh, both of you can give your answer. Well, I think uh, certainly uh, working with all the ID guys on ID Bombay was a great experience for many, many years. 
Uh, recently, we were in Darwad where we have constructed a, a cultural center for Darwad and that's humming with activity. So that's very really nice to see. Uh, I think the uh, work we did in Bangalore City then became the basis for inputs that we gave for the Jawaharlal Urban Renewal Mission. So, so the whole, till then, urbanization was not a big thing in Indian political mind. I think now it's become center stage with smart cities. So I think helping to make that shift into thinking of cities as where the, you know, the locomotives of economic growth and the locomotives of innovation, that was very satisfying. And now I think the education initiative, literacy one we're doing, looks like it's going to be good fun. So I think we both head and heart. So when it comes to heart, there are some visceral things that make you feel good that you are part of. So when a child would open one of some books and has this uh, expression of extreme wonder, somebody, sometimes children who had never seen a book and said, yeah, this is yours. And they just clutched the book. They didn't even need to open it to be happy. Those are the kind of moments that really grip you. And there are so many of those. But for the uh, head of them, there are the fact that we're able to help build institutions, the fact that, for example, through Adria, we're able to impact on public policy at different levels, that you're able to foster leadership on the ground, that you're able to take a program like the Springs program, for example. Many people around India depend on spring water. They don't necessarily have pipes and taps like we do here in Mumbai. And how do we help people to understand where what their water resources are and to create the kind of institutions around protect those springs. That's hugely satisfying kind of work. That is an open conversation uh, to all of you. Uh, right. In the NGO sector, we need to imbibe some of those features and we need to create more awareness about getting, you know, M&As so that you can develop scale. Some NGOs have money, some have people, some have infrastructure. Every town and village you go, dispensary, school, but no whiteboard, no anything. Some have everything, but no management. So if we can consolidate, there is a huge capacity. You know, that's one, I think, uh, study I personally would like to even work on and if we can work together on that. Uh, second model that I'm working on is private property for public good. This huge amount of private property sitting unutilized. They do not want to give away in charity, okay? And they do not want to rent it out, for example. Or they do, it, so what we are looking at, and you know the subject better than myself, that access is more important than ownership. So we can provide access to this facility and you know create more scale because there is huge amount of you know this kind of thing that is like. So I thought these are the two things. I mean. And a private property for public good, I call it PPG model, uh, compared to the other ones, PPP and stuff. So I think, I think uh, the second idea is really good. I think there's a lot of, uh, uh, if you can provide access to a lot of things without transferring ownership and all, I think it's great. On the first one, I think, uh, you know, what happens in the NGO world is there are strong personalities and so on. So getting them to come together and merge and all. See, market, there's market discipline, you know. There's some shareholder who's building on your neck and therefore deliver shareholder value. There's no such market discipline there, right? So it's difficult to get, uh, I mean, in fact, Rohi's been involved with one such merger which hasn't worked out so well. So so I think uh, uh, it, it finally, see, what happens in the NGO world, and to me the difference between uh, <coughs> business and NGOs, in, business, in the business world, uh, we have a common metric of success, right? We all measure success by profits, revenue, market share, earnings per share, you know, value additive kind of activities and so on. Whereas in the NGO world, there's no definition of success and therefore, it, 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 a lot of it falls down to individuals, personalities, passions, ideologies, and therefore it's much more difficult to harmonize these things. Can I see the, the same kind of issues, cultural integration, financial integration, or legal tax, all the kind of things that you use. Uh, you know, a small division in your farm for this activity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, <laughs> you know, stop me one thing, he's my good friend. He says, what you're doing, you can use the same skill set to do, look at the society, right? So if I'm a lawyer doing all the time corporate cross border mergers and stuff like that, I think that if we can work, apply the same skill set, you know, uh, uh, it would be pretty 
good just to see how the model works. Sure. Yeah, I don't know. Without so, the billing uh, rates. Huh? Without the billing no, rates. Yeah, I think billing rate depends on billing rate. If you have, if you have good deal, you'll find out. You know? Bill and, uh, you know, I think. Sure. Uh, no, I think you will see some. I'm trying to say that how can we create new models for scaling? No, that was my short. No, I think Actually, you'll point. see not only more mergers, I think, coming up, but I think you'll see more consortium. Yes. Uh, so that doesn't matter if I'm an individual entity, but if you're working together for a common cause, you're going to see much more of yes. those collaborations. And I love the idea of public, uh, uh, I mean, private, 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 private assets, assets for public good. Uh, people are already doing that in terms of sharing their cultural, like their, uh, their paintings or their art for public viewing. Right. And if we can also have, encourage people to some of their property for public parks, for uh, for creating wildernesses as they do in other parts of the country, might be a great model. Well, a question for Rohini and then one for Nandan. Uh, you know, the prior speaker for this audience was Bill Gates, and he made a very interesting uh, point about his own journey. And he seems very heavily focused on goal orientation. You know, he defines goal orientation. He's very clear. I want to eradicate malaria, I want to eradicate polio. You can define the scale of the problem, big or small, it could be doing something in a village or doing something at the national level. So I'd be curious to know, you know, when in your own journey with Arkin, uh, how important has defining a specific problem that you want to solve, uh, how important has that been? And you were a little somewhat dismissive about impact measurement, uh, and more focused on uh, you, know, you know innovation and spreading the the see the venture capital kind of approach. We're curious to know kind of how to reconcile the two. Is goal of orientation in your mind really important? And if you don't do impact measurement, how are you going to reconcile that with what progress you're making around your goals? Uh, I must admit, I used to use public platforms to um, speak up against an obsession with uh, measuring things. And of course, I've, uh, over the years, come to some kind of via media. I think we do need to measure. For me, the critical question is, what are you measuring? And are you only going to do what you can measure? If we're talking about empowering people to build their own capacities, it's very, many things are very hard to measure. In, in this space, especially where our society is today, how will you measure, uh, how will you measure empowering a whole community to become part of a solution instead of a problem? And some of these things is what we are trying. How will you measure when a, you want people in a village to put pressure on their gram panchayat? And for that, so many things have to be done to make them feel confident enough to do that to hold their own gram panchayat. Often your oppressors are closest to you. How are you going to measure when you're able to stand up to your closest oppressor? There are many things like that which I think can't be measured. There are many things which can be measured. In Pratham books, it was very easy to measure how many, uh, how many books we are publishing, how many people are buying them, how much reach we are having, how many more authors are there in the ecosystem, how many more uh, uh, illustrators are there. Many things can be measured and should be. I'm saying don't be, well, let's not make it, let's not be anal about <laughs> measuring things. Measure what can be measured, hold yourselves accountable and for the public good, uh, but don't, over, don't be so obsessed with doing only what you can measure. I think that's really what I mean. Yeah, no, I think, uh, yeah, I agree with that. Uh, uh, I, I think, uh, I find, obviously we get the measurement right, and there's a class of problems where there's nothing can be measured. So, if you're working in those class of issues where measurement is possible, I think measurement is also a good way to bring in urgency into problem solving because, uh, again, to go back to markets, I mean, when you run a company, every quarter you stand up, analysts and all that talk about some growth in revenue, or tell us. <laughs> and so, you know, you always have the pressure to deliver, right? So similarly, uh, if you're working in the social sector, I think if, you have a, if you're measuring the right things and structuring it well, the very fact that you are setting goals and targets also acts as a pressure point on, 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 on outcomes. So I, I value that part of it, but I would be a little careful about just being obsessed with measurement. But that, that conversation must always be on the table. The conversation of metrics, what are we doing, what are we achieving, how do we know, should always be on the table. That I, I, I completely agree and respect. Can I ask the second? 
So, Nanak, what you did was pretty admirable. Uh, I ca can't think of many people who give five years of your life to move from something as thriving as Infosys to something as complicated. And you use the word complexity with yourself as the government. Most philanthropists, and I would say even a very large percentage of NGOs, <coughs> are mortally afraid of engaging with the government. You know, it brings a whole set of problems with it fetters in some cases, challenges in others, unpredictability. Is there, for, uh, love to know your views on, you know, should people simply accept that and try to do whatever they can as long as at least they're doing something? Or is that a really suboptimal way of looking at it? And part B would be, what's the secret sauce, now that you've been on both sides, what's the secret sauce to really engage with the government in a constructive manner? Well, I think uh, it all depends on what your uh, goal is. I think uh, if, 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 you, if you're doing things and working with organizations and getting results, that's fine. But if you want to scale, it's very difficult to do scale without government. I mean, you cannot fix education, healthcare, water, transportation, uh, you know, environment without government. So you have to engage with government. So I think depends on what your goal is. So I, I think, you know, my goal is to work on things that have scale and that will have impact. And so I think working with the government is very much part of that. And uh, what uh, I learned from that whole exercise was that uh, it, is, it, it is complex because, again, going back to my market versus analogy, <coughs> businesses follow the same rules, whether Infosys or Asian Paints. From an analyst point of view, are both companies, and you measure them using the same metrics, using the balance sheet and profits. Government and social sector, there is no rule for measurement. Everybody has their own ideology. I mean, when we built the Ada platform, uh, there were people who believed that it was not a good thing, and because it was a privacy issue, or because they felt that we will convert PDS into cash transfers or whatever. So for them, no matter how successful we are, it was still a bad thing. So the success is not measured in, in the same way. So I think dealing with those complexities requires a lot more patience and often those of us who are in business can't relate to that and then get frustrated with all the dealing with all this stuff. Also the other thing is that people change. So you know, you have to make sure that your ideas are sustainable beyond people changes because some officer gets transferred and a new guy comes and it's not all over there again explaining to him what's happening, that's very, very difficult. So I think that there are I think techniques or ways to do things with government which which reduce uncertainty which reduce the uh, you know volatility but you need to you know do it in a systematic manner i, I can take a class on how to deal with government <laughs> we should take that class <laughs> is the government also a source of funding it is programmatic funding for ngos well it is and uh, i mean but i, I don't know whether that's the right model frankly i mean i think uh, best in my view that NGOs are funded with uh, private capital. Uh, first question is to Nandan. Uh, the two initiatives you talked about uh, today that you're involved with, one is the uh, literacy initiative for primary school tablets and the other one was the data driven governance. Uh, I just wanted to understand, you know, since you're heavily involved in committing your time, do you feel that these kinds of initiatives are better pursued through a for-profit route? Or a not-for-profit route in terms of success, you know, including things like you know, tracking top talent and so on. So that's a very good question, and I generally, if 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 there's a something that can be solved with the market approach, I would go with the market approach. So I'm not you know hung up about going <coughs> into route, but there are issues where markets won't. For example, let's take the problem that we're looking at, the literacy issue. The challenge is that though children are in school, they are not able to read or do basic arithmetic. And there's no market way to fix that problem because the, 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 the people who have this are not, don't have purchasing power, so they're not going to pay for it. Uh, there's no business model that, that makes money there. So the way we are thinking about this is create a non-profit platform on which market players can operate. So, Finally, it's about creating a, so let's say that we build a platform, which will be a non-profit thing. Somebody who's building an app 
can build an app of property. So that's the way we're thinking about solving some of these things. So use non where there's a market failure or where markets will not get addressed, build non-profit platform, but allow for-profit players to engage on that platform and have the market energy that we need. And the other question was, uh, similarly, uh, uh, what did you mean on data thing? No, I have the same question on data-driven uh, governance as well. I mean, there are these smart cities approaches where for yeah. organizations are stepping in. Like, it looks like you've chosen a not-for-profit group. Yeah, okay. well, again, because we wanted to open source the whole thing. You know, because, again, it's, it's, it's back to scale, right? I mean, if you want to improve 500 cities, right, you need to have a way of rapidly injecting to them the platform for them to manage better, which can best be done by open sourcing the whole thing. Open sourcing is a non-profit, there's no market model yet, but you can build a market model where the source is open source is free, but you sell services. So that's how you can combine the non-profit and the profit. So the way I, I think about this is look at what's the problem to be solved and see whether markets will do it better or whether uh, the state or the NGOs. Like in the other project, we designed it as a platform for innovation. And the uh, idea was that only governments are going to spend that kind of money to build an identity platform, but tomorrow people can build apps on that. And in just this weekend there was a hackathon in Bangalore, and 36 startups came and built apps on top of the other platform. But those are all innovators. Right, so idea is how do you design things where you provide platforms which allow innovation to happen. My second question, uh, if I can, Please. Uh, was actually about uh, going in London. I, I mean, you talked about your personal journeys and uh, you know, from a giving perspective, and I'm actually very new in the space. I'm actually uh, hoping to learn more. Uh, but uh, you know, I've been trying to search for an overarching theme or a philosophy, uh, just in terms of my own. Uh, and, uh, you know, the question came up during Bill Gates' conversation when he mentioned the fact that he's focused on healthcare and uh, sanitation because he somehow sees that as more fundamental than education. Without good health, uh, you, know, the, you know, the mental development of children uh, is inappropriate and so on. So I'm wondering, uh, you know, there are so many different initiatives that you are funding <coughs> across the space. Uh, have you all, I mean, do you think it's worthwhile to even pursue, uh, you know, an objective of finding an overarching theme that can, you know, sort of sustain your, sustain your giving for, uh, let's say, a decade or more. Or it's a futile exercise, best just to pick and choose where you think impact is high and run with it. Well, you know, I think, uh, obviously, if you, can find, if you can find things which uh, you can do a sustained intervention, no, but remember, I think, you, let's take Bill, Bill, Bill's philosophy. In the Gates Foundation, yes, he has this focus. But he also does a lot of stuff under the Gates Foundation where he, he takes uh, risks on something or the other. So I think if you're creating an organization, then the organization has to have its focus. It has to focus on health or education because you can't have them going all over the place. But in your personal capacity, I think it's worthwhile to support uh, multiple initiatives because you don't know which ones will play. Yeah, I think we mustn't forget that philanthropy is often driven very much by passion as well. So if there's somebody who feels that for any personal reason or through reasoning that this will make a fundamental change to something that I care about, then devoting your entire resources to that is as valid a way to do, do uh, forward giving as trying a, a basket full of a basket of approaches. So I don't think there's one answer to that. And if you are convinced that Yes, if I work in education, it's the fundamental pillar of changing society and changing opportunities. Then, there should be nothing wrong. I think, if, if, if at all, I have a philosophy here, which is that I believe that rapid technological innovation is opening up ways to solve problems differently from the past. And that's, that's in some sense, the philosophy that I have. So, I look for problems that look intractable, but something has happened in the rapid innovation which now allows us to solve that in a different way. So that's the way, I, and that's where I feel I should focus my attention. And that kind of thing requires both for-profit, market-based interventions, and really philanthropic things, perhaps in the ecosystem, where markets can work and government works better. So uh, I think you'll see more hybrid approaches. Uh, 
letting the market do what it does best, but when it comes to equity, you know, markets can't, markets are not oriented towards making sure there's equity in society, naturally. Uh, so then empowering uh, equity through either philanthropy or improving governance.
um, identify that they have an issue in, or they are so-called legally blind, as they call it, below the threshold of uh, uh, sight. And with the development of skill and motor uh, you know, abilities that they empower over a course of two, two and a half years, uh, they actually managed to uh, get some amount of vision and uh, independence to their abilities. So we are looking to My name is Nagesh. Uh, after stepping out from the corporate life, I set up a trust. So I use my money, my full time to, to do what we do. Uh, we started three years back. This trust is basically to make life better for people who work in retail. There are 33 million people who work in retail, right from Kiranas to modern retail. We actually look at a 360 degree approach to uh, addressing this issue. So, and we identified pride, respect, inclusion, skilling, health, and social security as six areas to work for, and our model is a totally collaborative model. We started with five people going to area five. In the area of pride, uh, actually the, uh, the program has gone global now. Uh, we actually started a day called Retail Employees Day and said, can everybody who engage with tailors, can they really thank retail employees? This year we had two million people in India celebrating, and Turkey adopted the model, and two million people in Turkey have celebrated Retail Employees Day. Uh, second, we looked at saying, how can we actually give, get respect to these people? We can't get SOPs to say how they do a good job. So we said, can we actually hear stories of customer service excellence and reward them? Uh, we got 116 towns represented for 1,500 stories. We selected the best 15 stories and recognized the top three stories. Inspired by this, uh, first time in the world, uh, a group of department stores in the world has instituted the best sales associate of the world, which is going to be announced on the 23rd, 24th. This never happened. Although we started this as a very, very local initiative, both these have become a global IP. Surprisingly, with billions of people working in retail, nowhere in the world of retail has anybody recognized anybody in the front line as an industry leader. So these are two projects which have gone on pride and respect. Third is on inclusion. Uh, retail works for the society, but retail has never looked at the society itself. And we realized that retail with 33 million people and 84 percent attrition require a lot of people with ability. So we started with a small one center program to see if we can get disabled youth from around, train them and get them into the job. We started with one uh, initiative with 22 disabled youth in the first year. The third year this year we'll have 900 disabled youth who will actually graduate, have all got livelihood, 100% livelihood creation, 84% retention. And all the 16 we do in NGO partners. We don't have, uh, except for one center, we don't have centers there. Uh, the fourth initiative on skilling, we actually tied up with AppTech. So we create the marketplace, we give the content, AppTech develops the pedagogy and delivers it. So started off with $1 a class. So in 18 classes we complete a course, good enough for them to get job. Uh, first year was about 500 youth. This year we crossed about 2,600 youth. All the four initiatives have broken even at their level. With just five employees in the corporate, everything is a collaborative model. We just want to be thought leaders and catalysts get people who already have resources, but they're very good at what they do. If you go to an NGO in Surat, he's very good in his local area, but his world stops at the local area. I mean, he cannot create a marketplace. So these are the four areas. Our biggest challenge is the whole society itself. I mean, there are hundreds of disabled youth who have got jobs, but the society said, no, you can't uh, get them jobs. Society says, are you going to send your disabled youth to uh, work, and are you going to live on their earnings? So our challenge is, how do you communicate to the society that you have to bring children out, bring them into such organizations that they help livelihood? So these are the four areas that we have already worked in the last three years. And the two areas that we yet to work is uh, health and social security, where we're actually working on models and seeing how to scale. Uh, our trust model is also fairly unique. I'm neither a trustee nor a settler. Uh, I'm just the founder. The trust is managed by ILFS trustee. So we have an independent corporate trustee which actually manages the trust. And the board consists of 12 individuals, six women and six men who actually manage the board. So it, it's a model which has developed in the last three years. Only day before yesterday, we got clearance from the board to now scale up. Till now, we have never approached anybody to fund or support. So this first viewers club gives me an opportunity to participate in giving. Also gives me an opportunity to learn from this group and see what we can do of uh, collaboration, not merger, but collaboration. Because it's, the merger of bodies can happen, but merger of minds in the NGO is a very tough one. Each one is very passionate about what they do. So that's me in the small class. Unfortunately, we're out of time for one last story or question before we wrap up. If there's nobody else, yeah. but I don't know who takes it. So 
Okay, Michelle, you all put the first question. It can be the last comment or question. Go for it. No, I think we uh, <coughs> talked about uh, philanthropy and the quasi philanthropy in the sense of uh, we discussed much about the social business, uh, the role of social business in the whole thing. And I personally feel that most of the not for profit activities or NGO activities can be converted into social businesses just about building a model. Some may get free, some may get quasi free, somebody may pay extraordinary, some may pay premium. So it's all about building a model. I think business modeling would be very critical, and that would be another part which will take care of some of the accountability issues as well as I think it gives more dignity to people than just giving you know out the door. So I thought maybe you know uh, some thoughts. No, I think definitely there's a I think there's in the continuum you have for profit companies at one end, philanthropy, you have social enterprises. I think we need all these things to finally crack all the issues. Absolutely. Ruby and Nandan, if you have any last thoughts you'd like to share with us. No, just that I'm very happy that Give India does so much work in this space and that there are so many people uh, who are doing so much more philanthropy in India. I'm very happy there's so much more public pressure on the wealthy and I hope that together we can make a society that we are all uh, proud of living and we are not very proud of living in a society where so many people are left out. So it's good to see so many people getting engaged in this uh, journey. Thank you all. The pace of change in the whole area of giving is remarkable in the last few years and I think this is an example of that. And we hope to this continue and we'd like to work with all of you to make that. Both of you are a great inspiration. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.